Okay, so we're coming back for the second video in my notes on the book called The Search for a Modern China. And it's an interesting title. I mean, it does describe accurately, I think, the book of where is this country going? You know, uh, it's come through the dynasties. You've had different people come up. You've had um, some wars with Japan. You've had uh, different segments, uh, fragmentation of the country with, you know, different uh, like family groups or clans kind of ruling. You have this experimentation with democracy. You have the Russians coming in, uh, Stalin, you know, teaching uh, the Chinese leaders how to basically, you know, control the people. You know, where are we going? What, what's going to happen here? Um, so we're in part four, war and revolution. So by 1937, there's a full scale war with Japan. And China loses important areas in the north, which had industries and also fertile lands for agriculture. Now, by the 1950s, there was a steady time of economic growth, and the country seemed to be under control. Then comes the Great Leap Forward with Mao, uh, which sought to end all the distinctions of age, gender, skill, and occupation. And I think this is interesting because we, we see definitely this continue. I mean, one of the great things about studying history is it helps us better examine the present. And one of the things is ending all distinctions between age and gender and skill is that is that really wise uh you know some people they love the idea of meritocracies some people say no that's not uh that's not fair uh, we need to flatten the the field um maybe we do uh, but definitely there are distinctions between between people uh, and individuals um and that's always something to consider uh, there is differences between men and women there is differences between being right out of college and you know being toward the end of your career You've seen certain things, uh, you know, skill levels, occupations. Well, we come into World War II. There's a leader, Chiang Kai-shek, orders his air force to bomb the Japanese warships off the docks of Shanghai. But the Japanese troops were strong and put the Chinese on the defensive even after using the element of surprise. In Nanjing, the Japanese unleashed a, quote, a period of terror and destruction that must rank among the worst in the history of of modern warfare for almost 11 weeks they unleashed on the defeated chinese troops and on the helpless chinese civilian population with a storm of violence and cruelty that has few parallels it was estimated that 20,000 women were raped some raped even unto dying chiang kai-shek ordered his engineers to blow up the dikes of the yellow river and soon a giant flood that stalled the japanese for three months but also at the same time destroyed more than four thousand villages and killing unknown number of peasants man this is awful so one of the things i've been asking as i've been going through these books especially as i was looking at the other book the one called china a fragile superpower is why is there such a psychological hatred of the Japanese and this Nanjing this must be the Nanjing massacre this must be something in the minds of people um, you know in the lore of the cultures uh, in the memories uh, in the stories um, apparently this is just really terrible I don't know I haven't seen anything more convincing as to you know how to explain uh, explain that than this event here says so most of the people in the northeast stayed living under japanese rule the author says they saw no hope or significant prove improvement by the political practices of the gomindang or the communists so it didn't seem to matter that much and we've talked about that in other books when we talked about why nations fail you know in in like theory people can adopt all kinds of things ideas about communism marxism um, you know ideas about shared rule um, but it really matters much more um, the real practices that are implemented. The Burma Road was the only link at one point to the military supply and gasoline needed to keep Chiang Kai-shek's resistance viable. Mao's idea of balance of power was a third, a third, and a third, so that no one group had too much control of the government. China was playing an important role in World War II. They also tied up about 40% of the total Japanese forces. Some of the results of the end of World War II was that China now had the full authority to try foreigners living in China by Chinese law and not under Western laws. The American used the Lend-Lee system for two reasons. One, they wanted to get money. So Lend-Lee system was kind of like um, the British approached them. They needed ships. They needed, um, you know, especially boats and Navy um, ships. But um, so basically the idea was, you know, you could, uh, 
lend it to a foreign foreign country and they'd, they'd owe you payments, you know, uh, monthly payments or annual payments. So one, the Americans did this just to get money, and two, to avoid the charge of arming the communists. Hmm. Well, interesting. Now, the Allied troops won back the Burma Road, that supply line. The bombing in Japan seemed only somewhat effective. Everyone was thinking of a long, long, long war that would drag out for years. And the Americans lost a lot of troops in the Pacific Theater. Chapter 18, The Fall of the Guomindang State. There was still, even after World War II, a disagreement about the power of the communists versus the Guomindang State. After the war, the Soviets came into China and stripped the best equipment, calling it reparations, you know, or, or whatever their rationale was. But they basically took electrical equipment, uh, heavy industrial equipment, you know, whatever they, they could take. Um, given the shortage, what can the government do now but print money or borrow? So they printed money. And that obviously led, like it always does, to inflation. Now, they changed to a new Fabi Yuan. They tried to decrease deficit spending on the military. They also forbade striking um, or like price increases or wages in wage increases. They had all the people turn in gold or silver or any foreign currencies. And this helped to establish the new Fabi Yan or Wan, I'm sorry, and gave some protection by holding a variety of foreign currencies. Oh man, that's so rough for the people. At the end of the war and even for five years after, the feeling was one of doubt after all the trauma. Chapter 19, The Birth of the Republic. Mao is seen as an adult. He has exposure. He describes the new government. They wanted to focus on the development of heavy industry. They still had the ongoing land reforms. You know, who owns the land? How should it be managed? How to tax it? Um, especially if you have communal lands, right? Anytime you have communal lands, it gets really tricky. Um, or communal resources like water, especially. Um, one of the results of the war was the turning against Western, Western ideals, Western societies, Western nations. Now Mao had the three selves, and most Americans leave China in the 1950s. The labor had uh, a three anti and a five anti campaigns, which had an immense effect. The Chinese Communist Party revealed that it was not going to protect private businesses any longer. The main purpose of the campaigns was to assert government control over workers' organizations. In contrast to the quote-unquote uh, suppression, excuse me, suppression of the counter-revolutionaries campaign, few of the three anti, sorry, redo. So the main purpose of the campaigns was to assert government control over workers' organizations. In contrast to the quote-unquote suppression of counter-revolutionaries campaign, only a few of the three anti and five anti victims were killed. Although people were fined, embarrassed, had property taken from them, or sent to labor camps, these campaigns were basically assessing the degree to which the companies were law-abiding. So that's really interesting. The government basically kind of testing the powers of the corporations. Chapter 20, Planning the New Society. The first five-year plan, which was a method used in the Soviet Union, was believed to be able to create strong economic growth. This was one way for China to become more anti-imperial and anti-capitalistic um, and enforce those or implement those symptoms, sentiments that already existed. However, in order to restructure the economy, the government needed to organize the people into local units in which they worked. So the Danway also increased the efficiency in their ability to do social control and indoctrination. The Soviets were coaching the Chinese on economic development. The Soviet model consisted of five aspects. One, emphasis on high growth for the whole planned period. Two, a focus on heavy industry development. Three, high rates of savings and investment to fuel the growth. Four, institutional transformation in agriculture. And five, a bias toward capital intensive methods. However, they also had to force peasants to sell grain. Um, they needed to set the prices on the grain, which left the peasants poor while it allowed the government to guarantee food supplies in the cities and keep wages down. They also curbed inflation. They raised taxes on urban people. They also restricted government spending. There was low investment in social services. 
The government sold bonds and asked for donations. The government went for more land reforms and placed peasants into forms of cooperative labor. They hoped to see an increase in productivity, in cooperation, and sharing of tools, draft animals, etc., etc. Writers and intellectuals became bolder and franker in their views of Mao and Stalin. By the end of 1957, 300,000 intellectuals had been branded as rightists, quote-unquote rightists. They were actually sent to labor camps for their ideas. They were jailed, or they were sent to the countryside to live for a year. <laughs> Chapter 21, Deepening the Revolution. Mao, in 1957, loses all hope of, re of reunification with Taiwan. This is the same time when the Soviets were launched in Sputnik. Mao always believed in heroic workings of the human will. And when his government plans did not succeed, he was troubled, and he wondered if he was wrong about something. Maybe he was wrong about humanity, he thought. The peasants resented the higher living standards of the urban people. In 1957, the government attempted to mobilize the peasants into, a, into creating a network of irrigation. Uh, the harvest that year was good. They tried to get rid of the idea of private lands, but um, instead put forth like this idea of collectives. So the government jumped on the propaganda machine, running on the rumors of a tenfold increase or even a twentyfold increase if people would, you know, go ahead and participate in these collectives. There was the great leap forward through the irrigation, which brought productivity to previously infertile regions. Somehow the pooling of duties of like cooking, child raising, household chores, you could, you know, free up more people, be more efficient by specializing in duties. And that somehow that would have these huge economic payoffs. That was the idea. Mal worried about uh, people lying about grain production. Before the Great Leap began, the median age of those dying was about 18 years old. But afterwards, it was about 10 years old. The Great Leap Forward launched in the name of strengthening the nation by summoning all the people's energy had turned back on itself. And it ended by devouring its young. Oh, man, what language. What, what an awful way. Wow, to think about that time. So the Marxist-Leninist precept is that war is inevitable as long as imperialism exists. China was afraid of Taiwan, who had weapons from the Americans. China was also scared of the United States, dropping an atomic bomb on them. They were, isolate, they were isolated except from the Soviets, and their economy was really not that strong. The Tibetans revolted, not wanting communist control, and the Dalai Lama fled to India. There were problems in Laos and Tibet and also in Indonesia. The Chinese supported the independence of Albanians from Russia. Wow, this put China at odds with Yugoslavia. The three isms. You had collectivism, you had patriotism, you had socialism. The demonized ideas were the following. Capitalism, feudalism, and basically anything that was extravagant. Then you had the three necessities. Loving the collective, operating communes democratically and then also frugality hmm what are the hundred flowers of Mao I asked I'm not sure maybe we can figure that out the cultural revolution of 1966 some of the fuel for the fire was the punishment of smart educated children whose parents could be tied to the gumindang the landlords or the foreign business companies there was this thing called a group of five calling for caution in cultural reform. It was a political group from Peking, and it had important members of the military. Now, by 1970, we have, quote, the bewilderment of the villagers is fully understandable. The credulity... It says the credulity of the Chinese people had been stretched beyond all possible boundaries as leader after leader had first been praised to the skies and then vilified. The most violent strains in Chinese society had been given free reign and the basic organizational structures stretched to the breaking point. The Great Leap Forward had at least had a meaningful economic and social vision at its heart. The great proletarian cultural revolution showed that neither Mao nor the CCP seemed to know how or where the nation should be headed. Man, that is really heartbreaking, right? If you have no trust in your leaders 
for the future. Part 5. Living in the World During the late 1960s, the leader of the Cultural Revolution had firmly turned their backs on both the Soviet Union and the Western powers. China insisted upon making its own society through its resources and Marxism. Nixon actually meets with Mao. There was the democracy wall protests, which desired more intellectual freedom. And Mao actually dies at this point. Then comes the four modern modernizations which is enacted. The four modernizations are one, industry, two, agriculture, three, science, and four, the military. In the late 1970s, there was a focus on individual incentives. There was a movement of private property for farmers. By 1982, they had reached 1 billion people, but there was a problem that unless they were able to check the population growth, there would be no hope for the improvements of the living standards. It just would not be possible for the economy to keep up with high rates of new people. This led to gender side, with people hoping for boys. And, I mean, the murder of young girls, the aborting of young girls. After the death of Mao, it became clear that much of the economy was based on favors, networks, connections, and trade-offs. As the last days of the Cultural Revolution came to an end, there was new developments in the economy. China had a lot of oil that needed to be refined, but there was also corruption. There was Western influences in art through Hollywood, which stirred the delusion of Stalin and Lenin. So, also we can think of the Beatles, the rock band, with their song Imagine. You know, imagine all the people living life in peace and all these things. Imagine no government, imagine no money, imagine like this kind of utopia type of thing if we were to get rid of religion and get rid of all the things that, you know, kind of, I guess, separates us or distinguishes us one from another. There was really a movement of secularization. But after the people did not realize the coming of the Maoist utopia, I mean, basically so many people disrespected the CCP. There was no real vision of who was the real leader, who was in authority, and who was the one that was going to come up with the next smart idea to lead the country forward. By the 1980s, there was new technologies that were beginning to widen the gap between the elite and the rest. Remember, there was that Gini coefficient that we talked about before? We should look that up to see what that is now, because this book has been out... This book is 12 years old at this point. I'm recording this in 2020. The book came out in 2008. But my guess is the Gini coefficient is a measure of, it is certainly a measure of inequality, and I bet you it's gotten worse. That's been the trend. It says there were a lot of government contracts that were won by under the table deals. There was nepotism that led people to become frustrated and resentful. This all culminated in 1 million people gathering at Tiananmen Square, calling for dialogue with the government leaders over ideas of democracy, issues of democracy, democratic you know, rule. The government responded with martial law. The whole event showed the people's cry for pluralism while the old guard was still married to a single state based on authoritarian measures. It also showed as people went on hunger strikes and the government brought in tanks that the government was going to find alternative ways for dealing with the complaints of the people. What can you do if the goal is progress? And the government, who is the main catalyst and tool for bringing about the desires of the people, and that the desires of progress is really an obstacle in the whole in the whole process. What do you do? What do you do? Chapter 22, Reopening the Doors. The desire to drill oil offshore and to refine the oil brought America together with China after many decades of little interaction. They say they often interacted by sending their representatives or ambassadors to Warsaw, Poland to talk. In fact, for years during the Cold War, the U.S. was trying to use sanctions or boycotting in order to keep China in check. America was also trying to get her allies to do this as well, but eventually they gave up, seeing that this was ineffective. Then China was given a seat in the United Nations and Taiwan was forced to withdraw from the UN. So in the early 1970s, for the first time, China could export goods to the United States. Previously, this was not allowed since the 1950s. Taiwan had been a good ally of the United States since the Korean War, which was fought during the early 50s. Uh, it provided United States also with air bases. But there were many American politicians who wanted to support Chiang Kai-shek at all costs as a means of avoiding the Cold War lameness with the communists worldwide. But there was not much favor for the two-state China solution. And when the Chinese were given a seat at the UN, it meant that Taiwan must be removed. 
Nixon visited Shanghai in 1972, which was a big deal and resulted in, quote, unquote, the joint communique, a document that summarized the point of view from China and America about matters of global politics without trying to reconcile them. It was just, this is how we see the world. Okay, this is how we see the world. And uh, it's very interesting. It's very interesting, actually, just to put it down and, and clarify it. Official stances of governments on various topics. Well, America supported the South Koreans, but China wanted each side to go back to their side. So the Cor Korean War we're talking about. Uh, China saw Taiwan as a province of Chinese mainland, making the issue an internal matter which no outside country had the right to interfere. They wanted the U.S. military installations on Taiwan to be removed. They opposed anything about the self-rule of Taiwan or separation or anything of the sort. The U.S. said that it acknowledged that Taiwan belonged to China. However, they were only willing to decrease the number of militaries, uh, military bases on Taiwan slowly over time. They weren't going to have an overnight withdrawal. Uh, going back, you know, Mao is declining in health. Um, or as Mao was declining in health, maybe we should say, Lin Bio, the Chinese general, uh, was already dead as well. And Nixon, at this point, is really facing uh, great unpopularity in America over the Vietnam War. Schools and universities had been closed for years during the Cultural Revolution. The students were forced to join the Red Guard. I said, what is this? We'll see if we can't put that in the notes as well. By the mid-1970s, all the old leaders were sick with cancer. Mao had Parkinson's disease and was only interested in philosophical government and preparing to meet God. The builder of the Red Army was in his 80s and he was long retired. So you really have a, a, a time of change coming. Wholesale westernization, in quotes. The Red Guard were determined to get rid of the four olds. Old customs, old habits, old culture, and old thinking. We see these numbers. The Chinese, they do a lot of lists. Uh, it's really interesting when they do their political, um, like political programs. So Ding... Xiaoping was twice purged from power and twice rehabilitated, emerged as China's paramount leader in 1978. So then it says, um, so, so Ding Xiaoping was, was twice purged from power and twice rehabilitated, emerged as China's paramount leader in 1978. So some guy was given 15 years of prison after being found guilty of publishing a magazine that had counter-revolutionary writings. And I said, what in the world? Then they had the big eight, or the eight bigs, I should say. The eight bigs, the things that people wanted to own. The television, the refrigerator, a stereo, a camera, a motorcycle, furniture, washing machine, an electric fan. If you could own those eight things, apparently you really made it in the 70s in China. The government got rid of people. They fired them if they did not like them. In 1976, Mao died and Hua uh, Alfing was named to succeed him as the chairman of the Central Committee of the CCP. Foreign policy became complicated by the Soviet support of the North Vietnamese. In Cambodia, the Chinese supported Pol Pot despite the terrible atrocities of his Khmer Rouge force, which committed against, uh, you know, crimes against their own people. And these were atrocities that shocked the world. Carter, President Jimmy Carter in America, his national security advisor, uh, Zibnig. So Carter's national security advisor, Brzezinski, seemed to have a favorable response to China. They set 88 key universities, which had strict admission standards, and they set some incentives for productivity on individualized basis. Chapter 24. In 1950, there was a new marriage law that allowed women to divorce. Better diet and medical care led to longer life expectancy. Prostitution was outlawed, leading more women to look to marriage. Malthus uh, was like a sociologist, had theorized the population bomb, the end of humanity. This is basically uh, just a continued explosion in, in human population leading to you know massive uh, stresses on the environment pollution and the exhaustion of natural resources well people were having four to five kids in rural parts of china the government pushed back the age to get married in order to see less births it also ordered compulsory uh, iud's 
this is birth control, uh, inserted for women who had born a child and compulsory sterilization of either the husband or the wife after the birth of a second child. Women were also forced to have abortions. 16 million women had tubal ligations leading to sterilization or men would get vasectomies. Another way to curb overpopulation was the encouragement of people not to marry. Some people did this and formed these like sisterhoods whose members lived in common and shared incomes and employment opportunities relying on Buddhist inspired beliefs. But marriage had become the normal exception in the People's Republic of China. With female infanticide, there was 107 uh, men for every 100 women. So not every man would be able to marry. Much of China's workforce was very young, meaning that they did not receive an education. In fact, 26% of the bureaucracy only had a primary school education. By 1982, it was acceptable to criticize Mao, as Deng Xiaoping was focused on taking China in a new direction and modernizing China. There were quotas, but with the rights for farmers to keep any extra and sell the surplus at a profit. Enterprises pay, paid a tax rate of 55% and were allowed to keep half of the profits. Previously, they had passed all profits onto the state. The incentive program had the desire to improve motivation and also improve production. There was a spree of economic crime. They started using identification cards issued by the state. The legal code needed to be rebuilt. Law universities were opened. There was a push for people to enter the legal profession. Uh, they started income tax programs as well. It seemed that marriage did not fare very, very well. Uh, when done for a financial reason, on behalf of the parents or the extended family's wishes. Um, looks like the Chinese were really into numerology. There was a lot of disputes over money related to marriages. The Chinese law convicted a man on marital rape. Huh, so I guess unwanted sex uh, within the confines of a marriage uh, was a crime. Uh, when the laws changed in 1950 for women to be able to initiate divorce, I guess that changed things a lot, uh, 1980s gave women uh, more rights to sue for joint assets. Custody cases became extremely bitter. The agreement with Britain over Hong Kong was an important point for the international community. In 1997, the British lease of Hong Kong expired. The English remained uh, the official language during the 55-year uh, period. And it would have a capitalistic economy as a special entity until 2052. Also, the agreement said that the economy and social standing would remain unchanged, as would the lifestyle, including expression, freedom of the press, uh, rights to assemble, rights to travel, rights to movement, I guess, uh, the ability to strike, have labor strikes, um, the rights of people to choose their own occupation, uh, for academic research to be conducted, as well as religious beliefs to be, uh, be lived out. Ironically, the rights held by mainland Chinese people under the Constitution were there, but were not usually given to the people. Chapter 25, you have emerging tensions in 1985. In every sphere of Chinese life, there were contradictions. So 1985 saw the first case of bankruptcy. The existence of such a law was a slap in the face of the socialists. Of course it was. I mean, it, it requires private property and the, the whole idea. Uh, students continue to push for democracy through protests, but they run the risk of being jailed for such protests. China signs arms deals with Iran and Iraq. They were also discussing the sale to Syria of you know missiles, uh, which were capable of delivering chemical warheads. They also sold missiles to Saudi Arabia. Taiwan developed closer ties through business with mainland China, so that relationship is actually strengthened, something that I bet the Chinese encouraged and were very excited about. It says the army killed more than 700 of the 1 million protesters in Tiananmen Square and other sections of Peking. Again and again, we see Chinese people being killed, but protesting against their own exploitation. The desperate followers of the Wu Lun, Wang Lun, sorry. So the desperate followers of the Wang Lun, the Lin Qing, the White Lotus, the Nian, 
the boxers, peasants and urban workers in uh, Hunan or Shanghai in the 20th century, all showed that there were limits to the indignities that these people would be willing to endure. People demand to be part of the political process. The last sentence of the book, there would be no truly modern China until the people were given back their voices. And that's how the book ends. So I hope you enjoyed it. It's really interesting. Obviously, it's not completely chronological in its ordering of events. But the, the book and the author, you know, they try to like tie these different things together. Thanks so much for joining me for The Search for a Modern China.